the full title of this um, video is Experiencing Visual Music as Art in Mind. And strangely enough, it relates unexpectedly to what Carl was talking about earlier. In other words, um, how music um, creates in our minds mental visual images, uh, which in fact enable us to live in um, a virtual reality of our own making. What I think Carl called living in parallel. And I'll be interested to find out whether you agree uh, that music can have this impact. Let me know when you're ready, Sean. I'm trying it again. It's just uh... we're, ready. we're ready when you are. And after this video is finished, um, uh, Anna Schwetz and John Weinel are joining me for just a short discussion on this subject of visual music and whether in fact my theory is about um, uh, how it acts as art in mind um, have validity. Just a short discussion and then we'll end um, with uh, what I call my demo piece which is called Passeggiata and I'll introduce what that is about um, at the end of the chat. So I'm sorry, I'm still trying to get it to play. It obviously right. worked in our tests, but it's a little bit... Um, All bit right, we'll, we, we'll continue going. Um, I found that, I, I mean, some people have been attendees at uh, EVA conferences for 30 years or more. I'm a comparative newcomer. I think possibly I've only been going for about five years. Uh, but what I found is the challenge of creating a paper for the EVA conferences has always inspired me to create a new piece of visual music. And um, I've now actually got, um, if you like, quite a repertoire of these various pieces. Uh, you're going to see uh, in Passeggiata, which is looking at the end of this show, uh, the absolute latest piece. The one that I would have performed live at uh, EVA had we been having our normal show uh, at uh, the British Computer Centre. How are you getting on, Sean? So I'm going to have to share it in a slightly different way. I can I'm see you to, something. Yeah, I'm going to the YouTube page. Right. And hopefully... I'm having a difficulty in getting it playing. Um, I may need to explain. Here we go. So hopefully um, you will now see it. I can hear it starting. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. For me, making visual music involves both a foray into advanced digital technology and a test of my skills as a clarinetist. Make it a bit louder if you can. I'm aiming to explain the visual mental imagery that is, art in mind, plays a pivotal role in both the way music is created and the way in which it is listened to. In the process, I think you'll see that there's much more to visual music than first meets the eye or engages the ear. I'll explain what I mean with reference to three visual music pieces that I've produced and performed over the last few years, Wagertheim, Beam Days Wazo, and Passeggiata. In this presentation, I'll play excerpts from the first two. The third piece, Passeggiata, forms a subject of my separate demo. I'll start in the city of Fatipa Sikri in North India. It's a ghost town now, but for a brief period in the 16th century, it was the city where Emperor Akbar, Akbar the Great, gathered together musicians from every corner of North India to give regular performances of Hindustani classical music at his court. So as to better understand the complexities of Indian raga, he underwent some training as a vocalist, enough to develop an in-depth appreciation of the skills of the 30 or so classical musicians he retained at his court. Soon after 
Akbar's move to the new city of Fatipur Sikri in 1570, he was joined there by Mian Tansen, who quickly became the emperor's favorite musician, even though at 57, he was well beyond the normal retiring age. One anecdote in particular illustrates the central role of music at Fatipur Sikri. Akbar asked Tansen to sing Raga Deepak, the Raga of Light, with the result that all the lamps in the palace courtyard lit up spontaneously, and Tansen's body became dangerously hot. But as Tansen had known in advance what would happen, he had taken the precaution of teaching his daughter to play one of his own compositions, Raga Mian Maha, which by repute caused rain to pour down. And when she played, the heavens opened and Tansen was saved. We shouldn't take such a story literally, because as Ravi Shankar explains, Raga's induce an enhanced state in the minds of listeners, rather than changes in the physical environment that surrounds them. Raga is a prime example of art in mind. The unbroken tradition of Hindustani classical music stretches back 2,000 years or more to when ragas were an integral part of Vedic ceremonies in Hindu temples. Then, as now, the universal, deeper meaning of raga performance was conveyed by the Sanskrit saying, Ranjahati iti raga, which means that which colours the mind is a raga. To an extent, I followed Akbar's example by immersing myself in Rajayati Iti Raga, so as to gain some understanding of the art of Raga performance, which differs radically from what we are used to as performers in the West. The result, Raga time, is both an oral and visual interpretation of Biliskani Todi, a Raga reputedly performed by Tansen's son, Bilaskani, at his father's funeral to evoke a mood of delightful admiration. It follows the oldest of the Hindustani classical genre, known as Drupad, a genre that Tansen developed into the form as it's largely known today. It starts with an alap, which is a deep and meditative musical investigation into the rising and falling seven-note octave, which characterizes Belaskani Todi. When performed, the alap presents a powerful force of emotions such as sadness, yearning and submission to a heightened state of awareness, where, as tradition dictates, the singer or instrumentalist sets the rasa, that's the emotion or sentiment of the piece, and at the same time assesses the mood of the audience. In longer time, I supplement this oral mode of expression with a visual mode, which reveals momentous events taking place in Akbar's court. I haven't needed to imagine these scenes in my mind's eye, because Akbar kept an atelier of artists at Fatipa Sikri who recorded every moment of court life in a series of Indian miniatures that are now distributed in galleries throughout the world. And from this immense store or memory bank of information, I've chosen just a few images that to my mind reflect the music of Biliskani Todi and tell the story. I'll now perform the first part of Ragata. Thank <laughs>
recognised that those images in Ranka time served only to provide a cultural prompt in guiding your responses to Biliskani Todi. They didn't add significantly to the emotional impact of the music. But now I'll move on to my second example of visual music, where I set my sights higher by making a determined effort to penetrate the mind of a composer so as to uncover the hidden imagery that lay behind his notation. The piece is called A Beam des Oiseaux, Abyss of the Birds. It throws some new light on this synesthetic world of Olivier Messiaen, a composer who during his lifetime revealed much about his sound world, but remained comparatively reticent about his world of colour. It was during a conversation with Claude Samuel in 1986 that Messiaen gave some first insight into the colours that moved with his music, when he explained how the shimmering stained glass of Chartres Cathedral had provided throughout his life a joyful experience, a place where he could fully indulge the sensory impact of his synesthetic world. For me, this was the key that enabled me to locate the imagery that lay behind the composer's notation for a beam day's weather, a piece for solo clarinet that became eventually a central movement within Messiaen's quartet for the end of time. All of my imagery for a beam day's weather was based on a single rose window at Chartres Cathedral. By incorporating in my interpretation celestial colours, abstract shapes and religious references all gleaned from my rose window source, I was aiming to second guess the visual mental images that could have occupied Messiaen's own mind when composing the piece. I'll perform part of it now. After a very slow and sad start, it becomes lively and capricious. after completing my visual interpretation that I came across Messiaen's preface to Color de la Cité Celeste, a piece written in 1964, over 20 years after the Quartet for the End of Time. At this later date, Messiaen overtly declared that its form was dependent on colour, like the rose window of a cathedral with its flamboyant and invisible colours. A description which, as it happened, aptly described my visual interpretation of a beam day's weather. This explicit reference to the rose window's flamboyant and invisible colours appeared to endorse my own choice of imagery. But how had this happened? Why had I chosen just this one specific rose window as my source of visual inspiration when in fact I had any number of other sources to choose from? I can see now that it was Messiaen's synesthetic skills that made my choice inevitable. It was his ability to accurately transmute a wide range of celestial colours into audible sound combinations that enabled me to hear the colours that moved with his music, and thereby see what was in his mind's eye. It wasn't so much that I'd found the right images for a beam day's wazo, but more that Messiaen had communicated them to me. Does this explanation sound too fanciful, I wonder? Not, I think, when we begin to uncover some of the mystery that surrounds the way 
our brains conjure up visual imagery as an endless source of fantasy. When we're listening to music, for instance, many of us allow our minds to wander as we experience visual imagery relating to past events or picturing ourselves in the future. It can be argued that such experience has some therapeutic value by making us feel either more energetic or calmer. Stephen Coslin, in his book, Ghosts in the Mind's Machine, describes mental images as private creations. Although mental imagery and perception, that is, that which we see with our eyes, operate in similar ways, they are far from being identical. With mental imagery, we can think about and transform what our mind's eye has told us. This is the key feature of mental events, the ease by which they can create scenes that never really existed, or, as Coslin comments, transform the commonplace into the extraordinary. Another striking fact about mental images is that we don't have them all the time. It can be assumed then that images must be stored in our long-term memories in some way that allows us to call on them when we want them. In this regard, mental imagery is quite different from vision, which operates whenever our eyes are open and brings us a continuous stream of images whether or not we choose to concentrate on them. This voluntary quality of mental images and our capacity to get rid of them when we don't want to look at them explains those fleeting periods of mind wandering that most of us experience when attending a concert. We can decide to indulge in them or switch them off. Such unstable images formed in the mind's eye, literally art in mind, can be described as quasi-pictorial ghosts. They can't easily be compared to the form pictures take in the real world photographs, paintings, or slides. There must be something more diffuse than paper, canvas, or projected beams of light that enables visual mental imagery to take shape. Coslin has put forward the idea of a visual buffer in the brain, which reveals at its center an image that is fully resolved, in focus in fact, but with decreasing resolution towards the periphery. This means, for instance, that my pictorial representations of Akbar's court are far too evenly resolved. It's appropriate that I've, cho I've shown them as circles rather than rectangles, but to accord with Coslin's theory, each image should fade away at the edges to the extent that the defined geometry of the circle becomes diffuse. As a neuroscientist, as well as a psychologist, Coslin was not only concerned in shape and diffusion, but also in what he perceived as three types of process that operate on images in the visual buffer. The generation process acts on information about the appearance of objects and their spatial structure to create an image in the buffer. We become conscious of this pattern of activity taking place and through a process of inspection, we can then recognize the shape, spatial configurations and other characteristics of imagined objects. And finally, through transformation processes that rotate, scale in size and translate the pattern of cells in the buffer, we're able to examine visual mental images from all points of view. I can illustrate this extraordinary mental facility by reference to those much maligned intelligence tests, which ask us to pick out one specific representation of an object, which is incongruent with others. And to solve, to solve such problems, we have to take an imaginary rotational journey round an object so as to see it from all directions. Only then do we know if one is either the same or different from another. These tests are considered to be fair because they use a common pictorial language spoken by everybody. But in fact, people have differing innate abilities to sense pictorial mental imagery. It seems that those of us who have a spatial uh, pictorial mind have advantages over others. These deeper ramifications of visual mental imagery have been the cause of an imagery debate that has occupied the minds of philosophers for hundreds of years. David Hume, for example, underlined the great resemblance between percepts and mental images in every other particular 
except their degree of force and vivacity. Others, including Jean-Paul Sartre, argue that mental images have a radically different phenomenological status from percepts. It's a debate that will continue to rage as long as the activities of the human brain remain mysterious and inaccessible to finite scientific thought. For me, it raises the question, can I or should I try to manipulate or control listeners' visual mental responses when I create a piece of visual music? Responses that might differ radically from my own very personal take on the music. I always answer yes to this question with the proviso, as long as the visual music I produce adds to listeners' experience of music, by informing on its context and arousing emotions that might otherwise lie dormant. To further describe the challenges and delights of making visual music, I'll turn now to my most recent piece, a visual interpretation of Luciano Berio's Sequenza 9A for solo clarinet. The composer wrote the piece in 1980, midway through his lifelong exploration into the idiom oh. Sure, you can stop that one now because we'll be showing it later. Okay. okay. Yeah. How's we'll the... go on to Pesegiata later. Great. A little uh, bit of feedback. How was that quality wise? That was very good, Sean. Okay, good. Looks fine to me. Yeah, it was very good. Now, if um, it's time now, Sean, for Anna Schwetz and John uh, Vinyl. Vinyl, sorry. Hello there. Um, uh, hello, Anna. <laughs> um, yep. Let me continue. Glad you're here. Um, I wanted to ask you, now you've seen that um, video, and I'm expressing all these ideas about visual mental imagery that we experience when we're listening to music. Do you find that happens to you? Interesting idea. Uh, I have, uh, I wanted just to, uh, um, well, sometimes it, it depends. It depends on, on the music uh, I'm uh, actually writing as a composer, but uh, it really depends. It really depends. Uh, but I uh, actually, the um, this um, question you have actually raised about uh, whether the uh, you as a performer you have the same, uh, whether the listener have the same image. Uh, uh, um, in the brain while he uh, listens to your performance. Well, they say they are three creators really of a piece of music. So the composer itself, the performer and the listener. And each one has its own uh, uh, its own response. It's in its own mental images. So its own interpretation. Uh, but uh, yes, I totally agree that uh, you can actually influence uh, well, propose your interpretation, uh, visual interpretation to, to that images. And especially, I think it's very relevant to Messian's work because uh, he had a synesthetic ear. So he was actually seeing yeah. colors uh, while listening to music. It's, uh, it's quite rare, but uh, some composers have that. And uh, in particular, yes, I think for Messian, it's very, very relevant actually to try to uh, show of it to find this visual form, which otherwise uh, may be, become dormant, but not in a sense of arousal uh, or emotional response, but uh, in sense of uh, things that Messian, uh, um, um, him, uh, can can have seen. Thank could you. have seen. I, I, you see, you could tell from that video that I sometimes get a little bit worried because. Um, I know some people don't, when listening to music, they don't want to be distracted by visual images and even the ones that they occur in their own minds, they want to turn off. And here am I applying a set of images, I'm superimposing them, if you like, my ideas of the music uh, on their mind. And I sometimes think, should I be doing this? But what I have noted uh, in the way performances are happening now around the world, that there is an increasing use of imagery combined with music. I'm not talking about Walt Disney's Fantasia now. I'm, I'm talking something rather different, something that emerges from our new media skills that we now have. And um, for instance, the, uh, that new concert hall, it's not a concert hall, that new venue in New York uh, called The Shed, uh, 
is devoted exactly to combining imagery with music. We haven't got anywhere like that in London at the moment. Um, I'm rather hoping one day it might happen. I wonder if I could turn to now to you, John, and mm. I'm, I'm, I'm making this very quick because you've only, you, you're aware that we've only got limited time for this. Yep. <laughs> but um, I wonder what your take was on this um, um, whole uh, question of um, imagery and music. Mm. And yeah, there's a few, a few different thoughts, really. Yeah. I've sort of been making a few notes down as, as, <laughs> as you're talking, but I mean, one of the, the things that interests me in this area, because as you know, a lot of my work relates to altered states. Yes. This idea of synesthesia um, is something that psychedelics promote, essentially, and it seems to cause sort of interconnectivity in the brain so that it will make these kind of experiences more likely. Um, but I think it's something that kind of happens with or can happen with most people anyway. And basically, it's to do with the fact that if you're listening to sounds or music, they're kind of triggering various sort of associations and um, and memories and things, basically. And those can have visual images attached to them. So it's something that I experience sometimes when listening to music, but not always. It's interesting that um, that research that was done mm. at the university only in 2019 um, ascertained that 77% of the population do experience visual mental imagery when they are listening to music. Mm. Uh, that fact surprised me considerably because I knew I did, um, but I didn't think quite that, it's quite so many people would if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost unconscious in many cases there. Mm, yeah, it's definitely interesting. And the other thing I'd, I'd comment on in relation to the, what you mentioned about kind of designing these things and should we yeah. be designing yeah. them or not? I guess the thing for me is it's similar to sort of reading a book or watching a film, basically, where if you read the book, you have the images in your head, um, but you can, have the, you can watch the film and you can have those given to you. Um, and to me, those are both potentially interesting and valid things. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy films, but I also enjoy reading books. And it's the same with kind of sound and music. But from the composer perspective, I find that the way I approach composing um, music, if I'm going to do visuals for it, is quite different to how I would compose it if it's going to be purely sound. Mm -hmm. um, because I might be thinking about the the sort of, imaginative images the sound might elicit but i would approach things sometimes differently if i'm providing those images yeah um so i wouldn't necessarily design sound in a way that i imagine it to elicit images and i'm thinking more often about the yeah. kind of energetic properties of the music which you also uh, touch I think on it's true in the talk. that most compos composers and yet again i can't get a i can't get a percentage on this are seeing their music in their mind. In other words, they are visualizing it. It's not just messier, but it's a general trait. Um, now, Anna and John, thank you very much for your comments. And I'm sorry we can't continue this longer because we have to move towards a finish. Uh, Sean, if you wouldn't mind getting the demo ready, Passeggiata, um, I'll just explain whilst you're getting it ready that uh, I met Anna at the conference this time last year. No, not this time last year, that's what I'm talking about, um, in the summer of 2019. And um, I, I hadn't started producing this piece called Passeggiata then, uh, but I knew that the imagery that I wanted uh, was in fact, I wanted it to be based on deep dream imagery. And we heard Arthur, earlier, Arthur Miller, talking about this in, in it. and, and uh, as you know, it literally was invent, invented by Alexander, a Russian working at Google, an artist working at Google, and almost by accident, he invented this concept of deep dreaming. And this really, and I saw his work at the Barbican exhibition, which uh, Tula also talked about um, yesterday. Um, I think it was the first time I'd really seen it. And I was amazed how the images that had come out of his mind all looked like a Chagall painting. In other words, the neural systems of him 
had had impressed uh, themselves on the images that uh, he created by deep dreaming. I used a deep dream, a deep dream generator to cre create the images for Passeggiata, which is why I just wanted to introduce that to you. And Anna helped me to find them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, just a, a little note. Just a little note. Uh, so uh, I uh, came um, just uh, very recently. I came across the uh, paper which was uh, saying about the usage of uh, CNN. Actually, it's convolution neural networks that is, uh, on which is actually deep dreaming is based uh, to reconstruct uh, the um, the internal brain images of humans. So just to a little remark on that, that it's very it's very appropriate actually to use uh, um, deep dreaming to reconstruct uh, humans' image brain, and uh, researchers are doing that in uh, let's say uh, uh, not artistic but uh, scientific way. So I'm glad you said that. Um, Sean, can we can we on, put on passeggiata, please? We'll do now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Earlier, you heard my presentation on experiencing visual music with art in mind. I'm now following up with a visual music demo that seeks to penetrate the mind of one of the most experimental composers writing in the last century. Passeggiata is based on Luciana Berrio's Sequenza 9A for solo clarinet, an exercise in musical discovery that reveals a composer expressing note patterns as a continual dichotomy between all order and chaos. That's why I now see Passeggiata as being a paradigm for the times in which we now live. It's a visual interpretation that provides glimpses of an ordered system not only on the brink but also on occasions running out of control. I completed Passeggiata just before Covid-19, the pandemic, invaded the world but it seems in retrospect, that its visual patterns and sound world have succeeded in preempting a vision of the metabolic whirlpool in which we now find ourselves. A whirlpool where systems of free living equilibrium have collapsed to a radically disordered state. You'll see what I mean when I add sound to the whirlpool. You saw there just one of a series of patterns given free reign in matching Berio's moments of musical abandon when he weaves fast and furious note patterns that collapse the piece at intervals into a chaotic state. Throughout the piece, I use a number of other neural patterns to reflect the constant perturbations of Berio's music. But there were other more relaxed moments moments depicted by slightly out of focus and dreamlike imagery that provide hints of an otherworldly passeggiata in and around a mountain village in Liguria, a landscape familiar to Berio because this was the province in Italy where he was born and lived. In Sequenza 9a, Berio explores at length one particular harmonic field, but he avoids monotony by springing constant surprises in terms of speed, pitch, and rhythmic variety. So too, the sources of my own imagery, manipulated as you see here by a series of neural patterns, have enabled me to interpret the multiplicity of Berio's musical devices with deep dream imagery. I wonder, could this be the sort of imagery that occupied the mind's eye of the composer when he was writing the piece? I'll never know, of course, but in my visual music, I'm always aiming to identify the hidden imagery that lies behind a composer's notation. In the light of today's parasitic invasion, my visual interpretation of Sequenza 9a reveals life itself poised precariously on the edge of chaos. It's through the medium of visual music that I find myself searching for ways of restoring life to a natural state somewhere nearer the order we remember, although inevitably 
still finely balanced on the brink, as I'll now demonstrate.
Thank you for watching and listening. Thank you, Sean. That worked very well. Thank you for yeah. putting them on. Um, I'm, I'm not certain how many people are left. I can see there's some. Um, uh, thank you for saying uh, we, we're slightly over time. And thank you for all the speakers in this very long session. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry, for the presentation. Yes, it was perfect. Jonathan, are there any announcements to make? Uh, well, there's uh, Carl's workshop, Code Reality, on yes, this evening, yes. if anyone would like to attend that, starting now. Good. If you, if you can uh, keep going. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Anyway, thank you, Terry, for finishing it off very well. Thank you very much, Jonathan. See you tomorrow. <laughs> You'll certainly see me tomorrow, yes. I'll be up with the lark. Great. Okay. Right. <laughs> And, th and thank you for Sean. Uh, thank you, Sean. It, it, you're doing an absolute wonderful job. Thank you very it, much. Learning a lot. <laughs> hear, hear from me. Thank you, Sean. Great. I'll see you all tomorrow. Yes. yes thank see you. you tomorrow, Sean. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.